Right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as many of you know, my name is Nikki Lefebvre. I'm the executive director of the Natick Historical Society. We were established in 1870, and today we remain an independent nonprofit, and we really thrive off of the support of our community members. So I always like to begin programs by just taking a moment to thank you uh, very graciously for your support in making programs like these and all of the work that we do possible. Um, much appreciated. I am really delighted to be here tonight with uh, Laurel, Laura Neville of Lookout Farm, um, which is the second uh, event in our uh, Meet Our Neighbors series. And again, the goal of that series is really to sort of shine a light on local organizations, um, educational, cultural, and uh, other institutions, agricultural institutions in this case, and the others um, that have shaped Natick in the past, continue to shape it in the present, and will continue to shape Natick uh, into the future. Um, we have uh, a special evening tonight and that we're gonna do things a little bit differently. Uh, my colleague, Gail Coughlin, uh, who many of you know, she's the research and volunteer manager here at the Natick Historical Society. Uh, she has done some research, very preliminary, but fascinating nonetheless, um, into the history of Lookout Farm, which is quite expansive as, um, as those of you who live in Natick must know. Um, and so she's going to present some of that history to us first and then turn it over to Laura Neville, uh, who uh, comes from Lookout Farm. She is the marketing director there and she's also a resident. Um, so she's got some really unique perspectives on the farm, um, both working there and living there. Um, and uh, Laura will present for, uh, for the bulk of the program and Laura will speak a little bit about the contemporary life of the farm. Um, and its recent history, particularly under the Balkans. Uh, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So without further ado, I would love to turn it over to Gail and uh, look forward to hearing all about the, about the history of Natick uh, of Lookout Farm. And, and then I look forward to hearing from Laura uh, about the contemporary life of the farm. So um, uh, keep your questions handy and be ready to ask them or send them my way. And thanks so much. Um, Gail, over to you and a warm round of applause. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction, Nikki, and thank you, Laura, for being here. This is really exciting. It's a very interesting farm, and um, I think we'll all learn a lot today. So the history of Lookout Farm brings us back to before Natick's beginnings as a praying town. We understand that the land that is now Natick was used as part of seasonal hunting and farming practices by Nipmuc and Massachusetts peoples. It is very likely that the land that is now Lookout Farm was used for farming before Natick's establishment as a mission. In 1650, Wabin, an indigenous man, worked alongside Puritan missionary John Elliott to establish Natick as a mission for the conversion of Indigenous peoples to Christianity. Legend states that John Elliott and Natick's earliest residents established Lookout Farm the following year in 1651. But what evidence do we really have for Lookout Farm's 1651 origin date? When Natick was established as a mission or a praying town, Emphasis was placed on a new type of farming. The Massachusetts, Nipmuc, and Wampanoag peoples who lived in Natick had long traditions of agriculture, but upon moving to Natick, agreed to farm in a manner according to Puritan norms. Most immediately, farming became the responsibility of the men in the community. Corn, beans, and squash, which are also known as the Three Sisters, continued to be planted in Natick. But community members also took on more European methods of planting. And as John Elliott wrote in his 1651 letter, many have planted apple trees and they have begun diverse orchards. It is now planting time and they be full of business. So we know that people were farming in Natick beginning in 1651. But how does that bring us to Lookout Farm? Examining the physical layout of Natick in its early years may provide some clues. North of the Charles River, where South Natick and Natick Center are today, Natick residents built a meeting house in their traditional We Too home. South of the river, the side of the river where Lookout Farm is today, 
Natick residents planted and farmed. We know this because residents of Natick and the neighboring town of Dedham disputed the ownership of the land south of the Charles River throughout the 17th and early 18th century. Dedham residents argued that the Charles River was the border between the two communities. As documented in Massachusetts General Court records, Dedham residents used Natick's farming south of the river as evidence that Natick broached the agreed upon border. Conversely, Natick residents, with the assistance of John Elliott, argued that the two communities had agreed that Natick extended south of the Charles River, so they had every right to farm that land. They accused Dedham residents of destroying their orchards. Undoubtedly, the land that is now Lookout Farm was involved in this dispute, likely as land that was being farmed. Eventually, the Massachusetts General Court determined that the original boundaries between Natick and Dedham had been miscommunicated, and the farmland remained part of Natick. After 1719, with the adoption of a new proprietorship system, Natick's land, which was formerly held in common by all community members, was parceled amongst individual proprietors or descendants of Natick's founding Indigenous residents. According to the Natick Historical Society's Indian land holding ma land holdings map, the owner of the farm's land likely became Hannah Tabumsug or Andrew Pitomy. The exact lineage of land ownership and transfer during much of the 18th century is unknown, but in 1761, the farm was sold to Captain David Morse, who later fought in the American Revolution. That's why he was a captain. The farm remained in the Morse family for approximately 75 years. According to an 1883 Natick Citizen article, Members of the Morse family understood that they lived at the Indian farm. Lookout Farm changed hands multiple times during the 19th century. Elijah Perry purchased the farm in 1816. Perry rented out an old house on the farm that was built by William Morse to multiple tenants. Leonard Perry and then later Elijah Perry Jr. owned the farm and its old house. Over the course of the 40 years that the Perry family owned the farm, they were very involved in town affairs and events, including the founding of the Natick Historical Society. Throughout the 19th century, even after selling the farm, the Perrys participated in agricultural societies and fairs throughout Massachusetts. Eventually, Elijah Perry Jr. sold the farm to William Richards, who then sold it to William Hanchin, in 1856. Hanchett elevated the farm's reputation to one of the best dairy farms in Massachusetts. Under Hanchett's care, the farm grew to 200 acres and included storehouses, barns, workshops, outbuildings, and multiple other dwellings. The farm became known as Lookout Farm and changed greatly during the 1890s. In 1891, there was a, proposed, a proposal for a lookout farm sale barn where cows from all over New England would be sold to interested farmers. In 1894, Charles Whitmore became the farm's owner. He envisioned it as a place to breed and train purebred racehorses and cows. He purchased his first Kentucky thoroughbred named May King in 1895. In 1896, construction on a barn began, with the second beginning in 1898. By 1897, 175 horses lived at the farm, many of which raced at various venues throughout New England, including the Rigby Trotting Park in South Portland, Maine. Lookout Farm developed such a positive reputation for horse racing that it even attracted racing royalty. A world record holding racehorse named Prince Albert spent the winters of 1898 and 99 at the farm. 
and many award-winning racehorses were born and trained at Lookout Farm during the last decade of the 19th century into the 20th century. Meanwhile, Lookout Farm continued to function as a dairy farm and sold dairy products to other local native businesses. For example, cream from Lookout Farm was used to make ice cream for the Boston Confectionery Store in Clark's Block in 1910. The farm also sold livestock such as cows, hens, pigs, and ducks, and made significant sums of money from selling horses born on site. The farm's success in this period surely came from the hard work and dedication of the many Natick residents employed there. From 1925 until 1975, the farm was owned by Cyrus Jenis and his family. Jenis was, by many accounts, a remarkable gardener and horticulturist. During the First World War, he managed the gardens at two of the largest hospitals in France. According to his superior officer, Jenis earned the highest admiration from the French authorities who inspected his gardens. Later, Jenis was recognized with a Medal of Honor from the French government for his wartime contributions to French horticulture. This medal, pictured here, is now in the collections of the Natick Historical Society thanks to the generosity of his nephew, Rodman Ham. A lot can be said about Jenis' leadership at Lookout Farm and in the community. He regularly joined Excuse me, he regularly juried local agricultural competitions and participated in a wide range of community events. The farm frequently welcomed school children. In the spring of 1937, for example, 50 first graders from nearby Newton visited the farm to see the recently built greenhouse, which had been designed to grow hothouse tomatoes. They also visited the apple orchard and the cattle chickens, and horses. Jenis himself led the tour along with the students' teachers. At mid-century, Lookout Farm spanned more than 250 acres. During the Second World War, the farm faced many challenges, including a severe labor shortage. But Jenis met the challenge by creating opportunities for young people to learn about and gain experience with farming. Thanks to a 1943 story originally published in the Christian Science Monitor and reprinted in the Natick Bulletin, we know that between 30 and 40 grammar and high school students, all, who were all boys and too young to join the armed services, were brought in to pick radishes. They came from Natick and surrounding towns. Most of them rode their bikes to the farm at 7.30 a.m., had an hour for lunch, and left at 5.30 p.m. They earned between a dollar and a half and two dollars per day. Jenis also recruited young women from Smith College to pick tomatoes in the summer. And he participated in a statewide agricultural initiative to bring black men and women from southern states to work on Massachusetts farms. In 1948, tragedy struck as the fire spread quickly across the farm, destroying a large barn and homestead. It was front page news and miraculously, no human or animal died in the blaze, though two firefighters were severely injured. According to reports, the farm did lose expensive machinery, a three family dwelling and the large barn. They recovered from the losses though. And in 1950, Jenis won a prize for growing the best lettuce in the local area. At the time, Lookout Farm was regarded as one of the biggest gardens in New England. Although Cyrus Jenis passed away in 1964, his family retained ownership of the farm until 1975. Thanks again to the generosity of Redmond Ham, the Natick Historical Society is proud to have in its collections the time book used by Cyrus Jenis to document work on the farm during the early 60s. And given that this farm is so celebrated for its longevity and its continuity through time, it is interesting to note that some of the names recorded here by Cyrus, such as Tompkins, 
also stayed on to work for the farm's next owners, John and Judy Schumacher. In 1977, the farm was purchased by the Lookout Farm Trust, composed of George Mumford and members of the Jackson, Channing, Clue, and Bacon families from Dover and Natick. The trust protected the land from being bought by developers. The following year, John and Judy Schumacher purchased 50 acres of the farm and leased another 110 acres, starting a U-Pick business and a farm stand. The Schumachers also worked to protect the farmland. In 1980, the Schumachers and the Lookout Farm Trust allowed the state of Massachusetts to purchase the development rights of Lookout Farm through the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program. As such, the land was restricted to be used for agricultural purposes only. To celebrate, Governor Edward J. King visited Lookout Farm via helicopter gave a speech and presented John Schumacher with a certificate of recognition and a check for $316,000. The same year, Natick Town Meeting voted to contribute $49,000 to Lookout Farm. The state and town funding aided the day-to-day -day management of the farm and allowed the Schumachers to expand the farm's operations. Throughout the Schumachers' tenure, Lookout Farm became a recreational farm where the public was welcome to pick their own plants, fruits, and vegetables. John Schumacher purchased the farm with this goal in mind, as he viewed recreational farming as the future of agriculture in New England. Today, Lookout Farm continues to operate a popular and successful UPIC business. And a big thank you to Judy Schumacher for providing the NHS with resources, images, and stories. The farm was sold to Joseph Casanova in 1986. It changed ownership again in 1992 with the Marino family when they purchased the farm. And the Belkin family, the current owners, purchased the farm in 2005. So I think I will turn it over to Laura now. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, Steve and Joan Bel Belkin purchased the farm in 2005. Um, when it was up in bankruptcy with the Marino family at that time um, with the goal of keeping it viable and sustainable farmland, uh, which is still obviously the main objective for everyone. Uh, and it's been a very interesting turn um, since that. Um, I think the Schumacher family did an incredible job and they were certainly dead on with their um, prediction that that is definitely the path of agriculture um, with farming in New England, especially being so challenging with the seasons. Uh, if you want to keep it viable farmland, the best thing you need to do is make it that way year round, which is quite a challenge with the winter months. Um, so he, he was certainly correct there. Uh, the UPIC operation has been a huge factor in keeping it a farm. Um, Everything's buzzing at once here. Um, so that that was certainly certainly a, a very good way of um, looking at it back at, at that time, especially. And it's actually really fun for me. I uh, grew up in the area, so I don't recall ever coming here, but my dad was a reporter for a long time, and he has a article that he shared with me where it was early days of picking in the, probably the early 80s. And it was this great article. It's exactly the same article that gets written year after year after year after year about apple picking in New England. Um, and it's this woman dashing across the field in the big bell bottoms. Um, and to think that really not much has changed. Everybody still flocks to their local farms and puts on their flannel or their bell bottoms. Um, and goes picking and spends a, a day outside. And the whole point is to connect with nature and to connect with your food sources and have fun and make it a whole experience with your friends and family. Um, so he was really right to start that process then so that people think about their local farms throughout the year um, and wanna support that. Um, that being said, when the Belkin family bought it, it was with the same stuff in mind. Um, and not long after that transition, uh, Mr. Belkin brought in his son-in-law, Jay, to take over, 
and he started working with a new agribusiness to continue um, because with farming, you have to constantly pivot and evolve. Um, you can't be thinking about today or tomorrow. You have to be thinking about yesterday, today, tomorrow, and three weeks from now, three years from now, five years from now. Um, so the, the next step was how do we utilize all this extra fruit? Um, what doesn't get sold at wholesale? What doesn't get picked by you pick? And what can we do with it all? And what can make people want to come here? What can, what other ways can we share this property with the community? And how can we continue it to keep it a community asset? Um, and hard cider was a no brainer. So um, they started working on that process, building a cidery, um, searching and finding somebody to make the cider, learning about it, researching it, lots of test batches and trials and um, the development of the tap room. And so that, uh, you know, just continuing with that agribusiness to keep the tourism part of it uh, to contribute to the viability of the farm. And so that took off. That was great. Everyone loved it. You know, the tap room, I, you know, feel was a huge, huge addition to the community. Uh, I've been living in Natick since 2007. And I was thrilled to hear that there'd be a fun place to go um, just out of downtown, just right outside of Wellesley. Um, it was, you know, fairly accessible and fun and beautiful. Um, I know I certainly love being outside um, and being able to connect to what I eat, what I drink, be able to see that and how that connection is just so, so valuable. And I think everybody else agreed. So that was a great way. And after that came the beer, which was really just a, uh, a no brainer, you know, the next step uh, to service that off season crowd of people wanting when they're not here picking in the fall and they're here over the winter and the spring and the early summer, you know, to make it something that every, everybody could get something that they wanted. So that came along. And right as we were hitting a stride and kind of getting into the right vibe with the tap room and figuring out, you know, working on relationships and figuring out, you know, how all this was finally lining up, then, you know, the pandemic hit and, you know, we were affected from the get-go with, you know, being a business where people are hanging out, eating and drinking and having a good time that, that, you know, those are the first places to be shut down. So with farming comes um, the talent of constantly managing. You, you know, if you think about crop rotations and longevity of plants, you know, apple trees don't live forever. So you're always constantly planning. So as soon as COVID started breaking, it, the wheels were turning. We were hopping on Zoom calls like this. Never, never did any type of tech stuff around the farm. It was a farm. And next thing you know, we're, you know, all Zooming each other and FaceTiming and trying to figure out what are we going to do? Um, how do we, we can't go back to the tap room. It's too small. It's too tight. There's, you know, there's going to be social distancing um, and everybody wants to be outside and it's over 150 acres. So let's, let's take advantage. Let's give people what they need, what they want. Everybody's starting to panic and feeling locked up. Um, let's give them the space they need. And so with that, we started figuring out how to navigate a more techie world on 180 acres outside of Boston in the middle of the suburbs. Um, when everybody thinks Natick, they think Natick Mall. And here we are, you know, going to try to change everybody's perception and uh, make a place for people to go and people to meet and people to feel safe and see their friends again and see their family and enjoy fresh air and, and serene views and kind of just take a breath and a, and a break from what was going on in the world. So we started playing around with e-commerce and doing four packs for pickup and, and everything to keep our staff working during the shutdown 
And one thing led to another. And then we ended up with a acre of outdoor seating. Um, and the barn that we used to process people for you pick turned into a kitchen and a space for employees. And then we were, you know, trying to navigate how do we get Wi Fi in the middle of the field so we can process transactions. And then we figured it all out. We found a we found a chef, we brought in new people, we started hiring when nobody was working. Uh, we went from, you know, maybe 20, 30 people in the height of the season to over 100 people in the height of the season for employees. Um, we just ran with it and, and really embraced change because with farming and with everything going on in the world at the time, we realized that the most important thing to do was to keep moving and to figure it out and to do something. Uh, and not to just stand there with our arms up in the air, try, you know, and say, oh, no, we can't do this. It was more of, okay, what are we going to do? Let's do something. Um, and so that just evolved. And from there, it, there was really no going back. You know, we now had this great opportunity. We, everybody was happy. We were just constantly navigating. And I think that that's a very, very important thing to keep in mind. Um, when navigating these kind of outrageous paths that we've all had in the last couple of years. And then came the, oh no, we have an outdoor restaurant, it's New England, what are we gonna do? So then we moved to the greenhouse and you know we're just constantly trying to evolve. And you know, like, like uh, the Schumacher family thought back then, it's really about the same, just how can we keep uh, sustainability open space, connection, um, and keep it all viable. So that's, that's really where the farm is now. Um, and it's from such a long history and all these various owners over the years. And, and it's every little bit that everybody did along the way to get to where we are now. And hopefully we'll continue to keep it going so that everybody in the native community can constantly have the same wonderful historic agricultural experience that is so rare these days and so rare in such a close proximity to you know a capital city in an urban area and and also a you know a very historic location throughout America to be able to say that one of the oldest operating farms is less than, you know, well, maybe not with traffic, but, you know, about a half hour from the city and that it's still going and that it's still viable. It's still a place people want to go. Um, it's still a place that whether you come once a year to go picking and grab some farm to glass drinks and have a great day, it's still a great day you're going to remember all year and that you're going to want to go again and you're going to maybe seek out other local farms. Um, and that if you're a local, that it can be, you know, your local spot and that we can service you year round and, and keep that connection to be parting, you know, to part of the a gem of the community and to make sure that everybody has a chance to experience the beauty of the farm. I mean, I know I've lived on the farm for over 12 years. Um, in fact, I was very happy to hear some of the stuff about Rudman Ham because I had known him from uh, Pleasant Street. And it's just wonderful to know that we have such a great, great asset in the community because not a lot of communities have anything even close. Um, so yeah, the farm is, you know, very happy to have such a, a big history. And really, I think everyone here is constantly working and has such passion for the property that all we want to see is the property succeed and continue. I mean, everybody here is like, eat, sleep, look out farm and just, you know, it's, it's a really great thing to have so many passionate people in the community about the space as, and, and to know that it's also internally as appreciated. 
Uh, so that's that's about it. You know, the Belkin family has been amazing um, and really see the, the greater good of, of keeping this farm, you know, viable. Wonderful. Very good for now. Thank you so much, Laura. That's wonderful. Um, I so appreciate hearing your expect your perspective, and I know that um, that uh, our our crew here tonight does as well. And uh, so, before we go on, I want to offer you a warm but silent Zoom round of applause, and the same to Gail. Um, thank you both so much for um, you know a wonderful overview of Outlook Farms, sort of uh, past and present. Uh, I already have some questions coming into the chat, but I also want to remind people that you are welcome to ask questions live by simply raising your hand and you can do that by using the raise hand function under reactions or in the participant box. You can also send a question to me via the chat and I will uh, get that question where it needs to go. Um, so I think I want to start out by asking um, a bit about demographics. You mentioned, you know, sort of look out front, the location very near to Boston. Um, do you have a sense of the visitation? Are people coming mostly from Natick and surrounding communities, or are you drawing on a broader um, sort of area with people coming to visit the farm? Does, does, do you have any sense of that, how widely known it is beyond, you know, those of us who are fairly local? Um, yeah, so demographically, um, you know, we're kind of at the end of our peak right now as far as the UPIC season, um, September and October. So in the September, October months, it's a large base of people from everywhere, primarily Boston and the closer surrounding um, greater Boston communities, as well as a lot of Natick, Framingham, Wayland, Westwood, Walpole, um, but year round in what we would call the off season, which would be like November through August, it's a lot of local families, a lot from Framingham, a lot from Natick, a lot from Wellesley, a lot from Weston, Needham, Dover, Sherburn, um, Walpole, Milton, Medfield, you know, the, the local communities is primarily. Saturday, you tend to, if you look around the greenhouse restaurant or the, the lookout um, in the summer on Saturdays, you definitely see more college, not college, but, you know, just out of college grade, um, you know, probably more coming from Boston and um, those demographics on a Saturday afternoon than you might see on like a Thursday or Friday night. If you, if you visit us on a Thursday or Friday evening, you're definitely going to see all your local elementary school parents <laughs> <laughs> and, and kids. <laughs> yes. I know there's not there's not a uh, Friday I could go down if there's live music where I'm not going to see someone I know. That's wonderful. Which is great the, because where everybody knows your name, right? <laughs> people yeah. come here. So. That's wonderful. Um, and actually, you mentioned music. I have a couple of questions here about um, if you can talk a bit about musical offerings at the farm. Um, mm -hmm you know, to now and, and any plans and for music at the farm in the future? Um, so now, you know, we've partnered with TCAN. So we do a few concerts throughout the summer with them where we mostly operate as their host. So we're just TCAN outside. Um, and that has been an amazing partnership. We, we really love David and Aaron over at TCAN. Um, so it's really just been a lot of fun working with them. Um, it's also nice that they, you know, to the front of it, we're literally, like I said, the host. Um, and then we just kind of help run that on our end. Um, so that's really it for the larger scale. Anything like that, we have uh, no plans for. But we do offer live music as entertainment at the dining experiences around the farm. Um, so, you know, Friday evenings, Saturday evenings, you can get live music at whatever month it is, wherever we are, whether we're outside or at the greenhouse right now. And that has been um, a huge success. People really like the nights we've had to cancel based upon the weather or maybe the band couldn't make it or something like that. We've had a lot of people that have been pretty bummed out. So it seems like it's been a good 
addition to the community to have, you know, some live entertainment when they go out for dinner. That's wonderful. And I have to say that it was one of those partnerships that just felt great during the pandemic to see yeah. sort of two wonderful local organizations kind of coming together and giving people an opportunity to do the same, just come together yeah. and enjoy themselves. And yeah, I, I, I love these. I, yeah. I love any, any time that you can do anything to allow people an opportunity to just get together and have fun and enjoy something, you know, whenever you can experience something with your friends and, and community, it's always so much better. So it's, it's been a great partnership. That's wonderful. Um, so I have, this is a, a history question, but um, I, I don't know, Gail, maybe to you and Laura, it's possible you may have heard of this as well. Um, we have a participant who remembers hearing something about uh, Sylvia Plath, the poet, um, who com comes from Wellesley, uh, working at Lookout Farm during the summers um, when she was a, a student, a young person. Um, did you, Gail, did you come across anything like that? Or Laura, have you ever heard that? I don't know, Gail, for- That's for awesome. I, <laughs> you know, I'll try to Google it. I don't know. <laughs> um, that's really cool. I hope that, I hope that's the case because I'd, I'd love to tell people that. I, I think that's really cool. But no, I haven't heard that. If, I've heard all sorts of, I mean, every time I meet people, I hear a story about when they came here or someone they knew or something, um, but I've never heard that one. That's pretty cool. That is cool. Gail, did you come I across did, anything? I did see a note and Nikki and I have been working like out of a folder of some like, <laughs> notes about Lookout Farm for the past few days. And I did see a note in there um, that just briefly mentioned Sylvia class. Huh. So um, we're going with that. It's, yeah yeah so it's what definitely a story that's out there and um <laughs> sounds pretty cool so <laughs> yeah yeah well, we'll totally have to do some a little more digging on sylvia class. yes that's, definitely that's, that's a story to tell um and speaking of stories to tell i i do have uh two questions here about sort of what's it like to live on the farm laura it's it's actually really really cool uh very amazing we actually lived in redmond ham's old house briefly um, which is how I had met him. And it was just like a temporary thing when, after he had moved off of Pleasant Street with Judy and um, we saw these houses up on the farm. We would go up there every night to watch the sunset or go to the market for sugar, flour, steak tips, whatever. Um, and we noticed that there were some houses. So we had heard they were for rent. Um, and I come from a real estate marketing background and my partner is also in real estate um, we had both worked in wellesley so instantly went digging found out that there were a couple of rental properties on the farm so we put our word out that whenever it became available let us know meanwhile we moved to a few other spots we were living in south natick um getting ready to move and we got a call that there was an opening we we're like oh let's see if we can do it moved into the farm and it was the day we moved in, all we could smell was like peaches. It was like a hot end of August day and we're moving all our stuff into this cute little ranch. And there was like this warm peach breeze and we're like, this is amazing. You know, we're outdoorsy people. So this is just, this is like living in vacation land. And uh, it's been over 12 years and we haven't left even though we had, never planned on staying for more than two. Um, we just couldn't leave. And then the farm kept evolving and it was like, oh, they're gonna make hard cider? Why would we leave? Oh, yeah. there's a tap room, why would we leave? <laughs> and then I started working um, part-time for the farm. And then after I had my daughters, I came on full-time and now I never leave. So um, <laughs> it's, it's been, you know, it used to be a little different. Uh, it used to be a lot quieter in the off season because literally the farm went dormant. Uh, we always had this joke that was this woman that used to work for the farm. And on the last day of the UPIC season, she would close the gate and she would say, it's yours now. And it really was, other than a few of the farm office employees, the farm would just be quiet. You know, there'd be the orchard guys, there'd be the occasional farm office people going in and out, but that wasn't really near our house. Um, and we would just walk an empty farm in the evenings with the dog or, you know, just to enjoy a walk. And, you know, now it's great because 
you know, some people might be like, oh, there's a lot of people. But for me, I, I see, you know, cars coming or going or families getting in and out. And I just think, hey, you know, they got to, they had a nice night. You know, they came, they had a cozy meal. They had some nice drinks. Their kids got to run around a little bit. It's nice to know that you're a part of something that makes people happy. So for me, it's really been, you know, you have a stressful day. I just step outside or look out a window and I see, you know, rolling hills and grapevines and I think I'm in Tuscany. And then, then I sit back down and I hunker on with whatever I'm, I'm doing. And uh, so I, I think it's actually been a huge blessing. It's been amazing. I've loved every moment of living on the farm, all the ups and downs, all the, you know, the chaos, the serenity, all of it, you know, I just really enjoyed it. It's been, it's been great. And it's been really amazing to see how much has changed in, in the last 12 years, and especially how much has changed in just five years. I mean, it's well, what's happened in five years alone is just mind blowing. So um, it's kind of exciting to think like, what more could come and, or just how to like maintain it and polish it and everything. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's interesting too. I'll say just in doing a little bit of research on this, the, the farm also seems to come in circles. So at mid-century, I remember reading in a newspaper article that there were about a hundred people working on the farm, right? Yeah. And that sort of has not consistently been the case, but now you're back there. There's a hundred yeah. people on the farm, but they're doing wildly different things than picking right. radishes uh, by hand, right? I know. And actually, I, I was writing some notes during that part, like thinking about how, you know, they were like recruiting and how we're always trying to recruit. It's like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Get the Smith College students, yeah. right? We try. We, we do get some uh, kids from Babson and, and Wellesley, but yeah, if we could get a little bit more of them in the It'd be, it'd be make everybody's life a lot easier uh, if we had the staff. But um, yeah, it, it actually is amazing how it went from when I started, there were maybe 20, 30 people tops, you know. And then and as far as most of the year, it was like, you know, the the dozen or so orchard guys and a couple of office staff. And now it's just, you know, over a hundred. And um, you know, a lot of those are just like the, the restaurant staff, a lot of college kids, a lot of local high school kids, ton of, um, every time I meet someone, you know, someone's got a friend or a, a relative that, you know, ha has either worked at the farm or wants to work at the farm as far as like the high school kids. So that's pretty cool. Just got to start cracking in and getting more babysitters out of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, on that note, I know from speaking with you this season, how, just how busy you are. Um, speaking of work, this is the height of your busy season. And I um, don't want to take up much more of your time because uh, you're probably going back to work as soon as we end the Zoom. Um, and so we really appreciate you taking the time to be here with us this evening. Um, you know, it's not easy to step away from the farm, even for a short period of time in October. Um, and Gail, thank you also for the wonderful presentation of the long view of the history of the farm. And I know that when, when we started looking into this, we got very excited about the history of Lookout Farm. So we'll have to um, keep our heads connected and continue to share some of the farm's incredible history with the community. Um, so big thanks to you, Gail, and big thanks to you, Laura. Uh, really, it's been wonderful. And, and thanks to all of you for being here this evening. Cool. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everybody.